let's uh, take a minute to pray, and then we will get started here with the message. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain that you've brought, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful sunsets brought on by the um, Sahara sandstorm, as it were, that we've been experiencing for the last few days. Um, even though uh, it seemed like a terrible thing coming our way, Lord, you used it to show your beauty, the beauty that you have uh, created in creation for us, Lord. We thank you that you provide for us on a daily basis, that you give us jobs so that we can make money to, to buy the things we need, Lord. And when we don't have what we need, Lord, we thank you that you always take care of us, that you always provide for us. Lord, as we look at what our duties are as believers today, I pray that you would give us the strength to stand up and to do what's right um, socially, uh, politically, religiously, Lord, that you would give us the, the courage and the strength of the Holy Spirit to do what you would have us to do, what you've taught us is our duty in your word. We pray for Johan that you would uh, help him to respond positively to this second round of chemo. We know that chemo is a terrible, terrible drug and that it is a, an awful process and it's just something that no one ever wants to go through, Lord, but we pray that he would respond positively and that the side effects would be minimal, if any at all, Lord, and that he would recover quickly. Lord, we thank you for this global outpouring of prayer for this family. We thank you that people all over the world, in China, in America, all over the world are praying for this family. And we know that you do not ignore our prayers, Lord. You hear us, and our prayers are effective. We thank you for that. Once again, Lord, we pray that this time of um, message would honor you and that it would be your words that we hear today, not mine. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, have you swapped your PowerPoint? Just hit the button. All right. We are, we're still getting used to this new setup. Hopefully it works. It looks like it uh, worked. Yep. Okay, good. All right, hopefully everything goes smoothly. You'll see a lot of no signal. Don't worry about that. That's just the, the iMac realizing that we have swapped inputs so that you can see the PowerPoint. Um, sometimes it just is what it is. All right, today we're going to be talking about Christian duties. Uh, I thought this was an appropriate break from my Roman series. Uh, the, the current political climate has gotten even worse, uh, where we expected it to calm down after the end of June. In fact, it is, um, as in, in the last couple of weeks, getting, the riots are starting back up. The division is getting worse. More people are getting hurt. And uh, I thought it was a good time for us to talk about what actually is our duty as believers. Now, there is no shortage. If any of you have been on Facebook lately, you know that there's no shortage of um, Christians writing essays as their statuses. Oftentimes, they, they get very emotional and they say things like, we ought to do something. We ought to show love to our fellow man. And then they go on posting hateful things on people's pages that they disagree with. Um, so it, it got me thinking, what actually is our responsibility? What is the role that we have to play in society and uh, not just in society, but in the church, in our own personal relationships with, with each other, with God, what exactly is it that we're supposed to be doing? So uh, what should be obvious is there are more than five duties of Christian life. Um, hopefully you realize that there are not just five things we're supposed to do, but these are five general uh, principles, five general areas where we have responsibilities as believers to act. And those are the duty to promote justice and not an idea of uh, what is politically expedient, what makes people happy, uh, but what is actually just based on God's nature. And then we have the, the duty to obey the law of the land. Now, this one right now seems kind of controversial because I thought the system was racist. So how are we supposed to obey a racist system? We'll see um, what the Bible has to say about that. And then we have a duty to love our neighbors. Now, this is one of the two greatest commandments, according to Jesus. And as we'll see, many of our problems stem from a failure to do this duty. Fourth, we have a duty to improve ourselves. That is to improve our own uh, moral standing, to, to make ourselves better, to grow in our relationship with Christ. 
And then finally, we have a duty to share the gospel, which hopefully by the end of this message, you'll see is the most important of these five duties. And that brings us to number one, our duty to promote justice. Now, this presents itself in several different ways. Um, probably the most obvious of these statements is found in James 1.27, where James says to the church he's writing to, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. He says, Christianity in its pure and undefiled um, form is, is two things. It's to visit orphans and widows and to keep yourself unstained from the world. Now we'll revisit this, um, this purity aspect later in our duty to ourselves. Uh, but what does it mean to visit widows and orphans? Now the principle here is, is pretty straightforward. It means that we are supposed to help those who cannot help themselves, to help provide for those who cannot provide for themselves. Now in this culture, uh, in Jewish culture in the first century, women did not work. Of course, they did housework. They took care of the family, but they didn't go out and work in the fields, at least not usually. So if you were a widow, you often had no source of income. If you were an orphan, you had no parents to take care of you. So these are people who need the help of the church. Now, in our society today, the church has abandoned helping widows and orphans. Now, sure, we might help out if someone's a member of our church, but eh, it's not our job. The government will take care of it. The government will pay for their health care, for their housing, for their food. We don't need to worry about that. Well, James is saying at a very base level, pure Christianity is to take care of people who can't take care, for them, take care of themselves, to stand up for people who cannot stand up for themselves. And we failed that duty as a church. Second is standing up for the hated in society. Now this goes, uh, this is not a, a racial statement so much as it is a uh, social statement. There are people who are absolutely despised in our society. Now oftentimes that's our, our congressmen. We, we despise our politicians no matter which side of the aisle they're on because they're politicians. But Jesus says, or the this, this story is related about what Jesus says in one of these instances. In John chapter 8, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in, their, in, in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let who, him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, what do they do? How do they respond? Rather than picking up some rocks and throwing them at her, they all hang their head in shame and walk away one by one. And Jesus looks at the widow and he says, where did everybody go? Is no one going to condemn you? Not the widow, sorry, the adulteress. She's not a widow. Um, and the woman responds, no, no, one, no one's left to condemn me. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. More than just standing up for this adulteress, Jesus went to the houses of tax collectors, perhaps the most hated people in society. Mary Magdalene, a famous friend of Jesus, was a known prostitute. These are people who are downcast, who are uh, complete and utter rejects from society, the lepers even. They can't stand up for themselves. They have no voice. And Jesus stands up for them. He heals the lepers. He forgives this woman caught in adultery. He shows love to the tax collector. And if we're trying to be like Jesus, then we need to do the same things. Next, it means to stand up against racism. Again, I don't think that I wasn't going to address this. Um, now, you'll notice there's no Bible verse on the right side of the PowerPoint there. It's not because there's no Bible verses about this. It's because it's too long. Um, so I will summarize Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 22. Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, which has an interesting mix of Jews and Gentiles. And if you know anything about Jews, they hate Gentiles. Jews in this culture are profoundly racist. Why are they racist? Well, because there are laws that say they can't even go into the house of a Gentile. The Gentiles are unclean. 
And so they have this mentality that the Gentiles are less than them because they're not the promised people. Now, this is an ideology that is repeatedly rejected in the New Testament. You can look at Acts chapter 7, 8, and 9 with Peter and Cornelius. And Jesus says, I haven't made anything that's unclean. Peter says, but wait, he's a Gentile. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I have made nothing unclean. This man needs Jesus. You should go talk to him. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus says, essentially, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no difference in our race because we are united in Christ. Because Christ has done away with racial divisions in believers. Now, I am clearly a white person, all right? Most of you are Asian people. Does that matter? I would say clearly not. What's my evidence? You hired me. If you thought it was going to be a problem that I was white and you were Asian, you wouldn't have hired me. Paul's saying you shouldn't look at race as a believer. You should not look at other Christians and say, oh man, that guy's black. We should ignore him. No, rather, we are all being built up together into one holy people, into one church, into the bride of Christ through the Holy Spirit. There is no longer a race when it comes to Christianity. There's just the church. Now, what does that mean for us? If Paul takes such an active stance against such racism, who are we to think that we don't have to? Who are we to think that it's okay for us to let society fall apart and for racist tendencies to continue? We have a duty, like Paul had a duty, to stand up for people of other races. Why? Because we know that there is no real difference between a white man and a black man and an Asian man. They are all human beings. They are all created in the image of God. Now, finally, in our duty to promote justice, the last group of people who cannot stand up for themselves are the unborn. We have supremely failed in this regard as a church. David tells us in Psalm 139, for you formed, he's, he's talking to God, he says, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. David says, God, you knew me before I was born. You fashioned me with love and with care intricately. You wove me together. Who are we to say that convenience or that um, monetary constraints or privacy or family difficulties are reasons to kill what God is knitting together. Who are we to say that the unborn don't matter, that they're not a life? That, right there, the Bible says, is a life. Being carefully, fearfully, and wonderfully made. God knows you before you're born. How can that be if you're just a clump of cells? How can that be? And the answer is, it can't. And we as Christians cannot rationalize this idea that you should have a right to choose to, to have an abortion. We can't rationalize that with Scripture. We have to ignore verses like this. And that's not politically convenient. Now, I was driving through Atlanta on Friday. I drove south all the way to um, exit 60 to Fairburn. Or, yeah. And then I turned around and came back. I was dropping off the baby with my, uh, with my dad. And I saw exactly one protest. And it wasn't a Black Lives Matter protest, which I kind of expected to see as I drove past the Capitol. Um, I saw a pro-life protest. Why is it that Christians in this country have to protest to protect the life of an unborn child? Because the church has failed to do our duty. We have failed to stand up. For the unborn. They can't help themselves. They have no voice.
but God is knitting them together. More than that, we have a duty, or not more than that, we also have a duty to obey the law. Now, I know I've got to speed up a little bit here. I spent a lot more time on that than I intended to. We have a duty to obey the law. Why? Because the government is God's tool for good. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 13, we'll look at it in a few weeks, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant. For what? For your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Now, why do we have a duty to obey the government? We have a duty to obey the government because God put them in place to enact his judgment. God put them in place to promote justice. Now, are they perfect? Absolutely not. And there are some cases where we should not obey the government. Obedience to the government is always dependent on God's justice, on God's morality. When Daniel is in Persia and they, they pass a law that says you can't worship anyone but the king, what does Daniel do? He says, it says, when Daniel knew that, he, that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Now, Daniel is a treasure trove of civil disobedience. But he's not the only person. When the government does something that contradicts the law of God, the law of God has to come out on top. It's the same thing when, when the federal government passes a law, the states and the locals cannot contradict that law. The federal government is supreme in America. In the same way, for Christians, the federal government's laws cannot supersede God's laws. We cannot follow the federal government if they're disobeying God's moral commands. And in fact, we have a responsibility as demonstrated by Daniel to continue to do what we know is right. But in all of this, we have a duty to pray for our leaders. There's a lot of Paul in here. Paul, when he's writing to Timothy, says, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul says, the purpose of us praying for our leaders isn't so that we feel good. It's because God wants everyone to be saved and he wants us to be able to live in peace and have a quiet life and live a godly and dignified life. If you think our prayers don't mean anything, you clearly haven't read scripture. You clearly haven't prayed enough because I've seen prayers change any number of situations. I've seen people who were declared dead back to life. I can tell you that story later if you want, if you don't believe me. This brings us to our duty to love our neighbors. Now, this stems from what is often referred to as the greatest commandment. The, there's a lawyer, and he's trying to trick Jesus, and he says, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, I challenge you, pick any command in Scripture, any law, that doesn't fall under one of these two categories. Jesus is saying they all depend on that. It's either you are obeying God's morality and you're loving God, or you are obeying God's civil commands and you're loving your neighbor. All of the sins stem from this lack of love, either for God or for your neighbor. Therefore, lack of love is the primary issue plaguing our society. You just look around. 
if everybody loved their neighbors, if everybody loved God, this wouldn't be an issue. There wouldn't be protests in the street. There wouldn't be hate crimes. There wouldn't be violence. There wouldn't be theft. It all leads back to a lack of love. Now, what do we do in response? We have to treat everybody with the dignity that they deserve as human beings. Uh, Genesis gives us a good, ben, a good uh, basis for this in verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image. He's, he's talking amongst himself, amongst the Trinity. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God is saying, let's make man and he will be the capstone of creation. He's going to be the, the peak of our creative act here. Man is to have dominion over the rest of creation. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. And it's one aspect of it. We are, as human beings, put in a position of overwhelming authority and responsibility to creation, over creation and to creation. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, what does this tell us? We have four statements here in these two verses about making man in the image of God. What does this mean? This means that every human being is deserving of the dignity of being made in the image of God. There is no one on this planet that has ever existed that should be treated any differently than any other person. We all have human dignity. We are all made in the image of God. Again, if we just treated people with dignity, how much better would our society be? How much more effective would the gospel be if we treated people with the dignity they deserved? This brings us to our next duty, which is the duty to improve ourselves. Now we're shifting from the external, from the things we have to do for other people to the things we have to do for ourselves and for the church. Our goal is to become more like Jesus in everything we do. How do I know this? Well, it's all over the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 and 11, 1, which is like three verses here. Say, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything, I do not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. And then Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul says, my responsibility is to imitate Christ. And if your responsibility is to imitate me, then your responsibility is to imitate Christ. And guess what? That means. As believers, our responsibility is to follow Christ, to become imitators of Christ. We have to become more like Jesus. First John is a good example of this. Um, if you've ever read the letter of First John, it's clear that John wants to assure that church of their salvation. But some of these come across as, as pretty stark warnings. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. It is a requirement of Christianity to become like Jesus. So we have a duty to become more like Jesus. What does that mean? That means we have to break our sinful habits. Now, of course, that is not perfectly possible, as we'll see in a minute. We cannot get rid of all of our sin because we have a corrupt flesh. David says in Psalm 119, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. David says, The result of getting rid of your sinful habits, the result of keeping God's commands, is blessedness. If we break our sinful habits, if we rely on Christ, if we follow after God rather than after our own desires, we certainly won't be put to shame. 
Now, how do you do that? David doesn't leave us hanging. Two verses later, he tells us, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I've stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. How do you keep your way pure? How do you break your sinful habits? You guard your way according to the word. You spend time learning God's word. You store it up in your heart so that you don't sin against him. You make it your guiding light, a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. You have to get to know God. And how do you get to know someone? Well, God thankfully has revealed himself to us in his word. So all you have to do is read his word to know who he is. But to have that relationship with him, you have to spend time talking to him. Do you know anyone that you have a relationship with that you never talk to? Like literally never. Now, I've got friends and acquaintances that I maybe speak to once a year, which is not, um, not good because, you know, I consider them friends. But we treat God that way. We don't pray like we should. We don't pray enough. We should be praying without ceasing. We should spend our lives communicating with God. Our duty is to hide his word in our hearts so that we might not sin against him. To meditate on his precepts. To get to know God better. To build our relationship with him. But you can't do it on your own. You can't do it under your own power. It's impossible. Even Paul realizes that he can't do it on his own. As we read in Romans chapter 7 a couple weeks ago, Paul says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, in my flesh, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells within my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, despite the fact that I love God's law, despite the fact that I want to do what's right, my sinful flesh fights against that. It makes me captive to the law of sin. I can't break that myself. If any of us are honest, we can't break our sinful habits on our own. But we don't have to. Paul finishes that thought. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? Because Jesus delivers us from our body of death. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, gives us the strength to break those simple habits, to build our relationship with God. Moreover, we have a duty to improve the church as a whole. The Bible says, do not neglect the gathering together as some have made a habit of doing. It also says, encourage one another and build each other up and bear each other's burdens. We have to be together. You can't be a Christian on your own and expect success. You have to meet with other believers. You have to have that encouragement. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. This brings us to our final duty, the duty to share the gospel. Now, this one is um, more uh, societally driven. Of course, not the duty to share the gospel, but the, the justification here. All of the world's problems stem from sin. What do I mean? I mean that literally every problem in creation is a result of sin. Natural disasters, a result of sin. The Saharan dust storm, a result of sin. But, you know, not that bad. It gave us some pretty sunsets. Coronavirus, a result of sin. Rioting, murdering, violence, looting, a result of sin. All hatred, all violence, all criminal acts, all of these things stem from that lack of love. The, the dead 
to sin or dead in sin that our society, that is the, the state of our society. You think this is a Christian nation? You think we believe in Jesus as a whole nation? We don't. Look around. It's not hard to see. No amount of political grandstanding is going to fix this. No law that anyone could pass can get rid of racism. No hate crime bill could ever get rid of bigotry. No amount of standing um, up in Congress and virtue signaling is going to get you anywhere. You cannot solve the problems our society face with politics. There's nothing you can do. And that's hard to accept. It's hard to realize. But the reason there's nothing you can do politically is because this isn't a political problem. The, the issues in our society are not a result of our laws. It's not a result of systematic oppression. It's not a result of any of that. It is a result of sin. And it may manifest in oppression. It may manifest in racism, and it does often. But there's nothing you can do as a politician, as a political activist. No Facebook post you make is going to end racism. You cannot do it. Take that pressure off of your shoulders. You cannot fix it. But there is one thing you can do. You can fix the sin issue in society. How do you do that? Well, try sharing the gospel. If they knew Jesus, if they loved the Lord, and if they knew his word, and if they followed Jesus, I guarantee you they wouldn't be doing all of this. They is not um, one side. They is anyone committing sin literally everywhere. But we have to be the ones to tell them. No one else is going to do it. Your government is not going to tell them the gospel. In fact, that's kind of the point. Separating church from state. Romans chapter 10, verse 11 and following says, For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Sounds like Psalm 119 a little bit there. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. What's our responsibility? How do we fix society? If you've noticed, the, the degradation of society has followed the secular, secularization of society. The more secular we become, the worse these problems get. Because they're not political problems. They are spiritual problems. It's a lack of love. It is a lack of knowledge of the gospel that's bringing about these problems. How do we fix it? We have to tell them the gospel. Because otherwise, there's no way they can believe. There's no way they can be saved and transformed. What now? What do we do? Well, there's a lot we have to do. We have a duty to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves, to obey the government, to love our neighbor, to improve ourselves, to share the gospel. I remind you, you can't fix the world. You are incapable under your human power to fix the world. It's not going to happen. The gospel is the only thing that can fix the world. The gospel is the only thing that can change hearts and minds. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the clear instructions you give us in your word for how we are to act as believers. Lord, we pray that as we go out from here,
that we wouldn't be cowards, that we wouldn't sit around and do nothing and watch the world burn, but Lord, that we would share the gospel with those who need it, that we would be active in our faith, that we would work on improving ourselves and standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves, Lord. I pray that you would give us the strength to say what needs to be said and the courage to share your gospel with the world. As we go out from here, I pray that you protect us from the, uh, from the dangers that we face in society so that we can be effective ministers for your gospel. That's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.